How many times do you think I've climbed these stairs? Coming up to this pulpit. Hundreds. Hundreds of times. Hundreds of times. And every time I come up those stairs, I come with the full expectation that the Lord's going to use me and somebody's going to meet the Lord that doesn't know him. Somebody's going to be encouraged. Somebody needs to hear what the Lord wants me to say. Every time I climb those stairs, I don't ever climb the stairs just for form or fashion. It's never just because it's Sunday. It's always because he told me to climb the stairs. I have every expectation that when I get up here, he's going to be here with me. And I'm not here by myself. Now, how many times have you come through that door? What do you come with that, through that door with an expectation of? Because it doesn't just matter how many times I climb the stairs. It also matters when you come through the door. What do you come to the door expecting? What do you come through that door needing? Sometimes I think we don't sit down and analyze exactly what the Lord has us doing. He's not wasteful. He doesn't just have us doing things just because. There's always a purpose. Think about it sometimes and pray about it. And say, Lord, what is it you would have me to do? The only reason I mention this is because Sometimes we can't see the end result of what God has us doing. It's not always meant for us to be able to see that. But that doesn't mean that what we're doing is not important and impactful. I have every confidence that the things he has me doing in terms of leading this church today will bear fruit as we move forward. I wouldn't start the training on the Awana program if I didn't think it was going to bear fruit for us. A farmer doesn't plant a tree expecting that the crop will come the next day. He, he plants it expecting that there's going to be a full harvest at some point. And I came to tell you today that that's what I expect. Now, will I be the one to realize the harvest? I don't know. But that's not important. Because he didn't tell me to go out and harvest today. He just told me to go plant. And as long as I go do the part that he told me to do, then I've been obedient to the Lord. But I know the Lord ain't just talking to me. He's talking to all of us. What's he telling you to do today for tomorrow? I know he's telling you something if you're listening. Keep listening. Keep being obedient started a sermon series last week. The title of the sermon series is The Struggle is Real. The Struggle is Real. I don't have to have a sermon series for you to know that, do I? Everybody in here knows that the struggle is indeed real. Your struggle may not be my struggle. Yeah, last week we had, a, I think, a great conversation talking about Peter and his faith. But the conversation also involved, in the same conversation, look at this. We talked about Peter and his faith. At the same time, we talked about Peter and his fear. Wow. Wow. Same conversation, we talked about both of them. So we talked about when faith and fear collide. Because that happens to us. Sometimes, sometimes we have to keep on pushing through even when we are afraid. You know, we have to hang on to hope. 
hope can continue to help us lead to stronger and growing faith. And so today, I want to continue in that theme and move to another topic. Fear was the topic du jour last Sunday. This Sunday, I want to talk about the topic of the day is what I'm saying. This Sunday, I want to talk about another issue that I believe plagues the church. Plagues the church. And the reason this topic plagues the church is because it pl plagues believers. All right? I'm talking about everybody in here, but I'm specifically talking about believers. Because sometimes we think that because when we say I love the Lord, that creates a, prophylact a prophylactic, a covering that prevents stuff from happening to us. It makes us unable to experience the realities of life. And I came to tell you that your faith will get you, get you through it, not let you avoid it. That's the purpose of your faith. Yeah. He just promised you. He didn't promise you you wouldn't go through anything. He just said, I'll be with you when you go through it. And that's all the assurance you need. And so this Sunday, if you will, turn to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel. Old Testament, I mean New Testament last week. Let's go an Old Testament lesson this week. 1 Samuel 18, 6, and 9. I don't anticipate a whole lot of amens today. This is one of those thinking sermons, I think, where people say, hmm, is it me? Is that me? Is that me? And that's okay, because that's what church is. Welcome to the laboratory of life. 1 Samuel 18 verses, I'm going to start reading at verse 6 and see if you recognize this passage of scripture. When the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing, with joyful songs and with tambourines and lutes. As they danced, they sang. Saul has slain his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. Saul was very angry. This refrain galled him. They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought. But me with only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? And from that time on, Saul, I'm going to read the way the Bible says, and then I'm going to tell you how we say it. Saul kept a jealous eye on David. We say Saul kept a side eye on David. Today I want to talk about the green-eyed monster. The green-eyed monster battling jealousy. A few, a few months ago, the nation was once again thrust back into the middle of an epidemic because there are people who will not take their children to get vaccinated against the measles. These people have short memories. They don't know how virulent the measles were at one point in our country's history. They don't understand the significance of how it has devastated and impacted lives for years. They choose to believe that instead of measles being the problem, it's in fact the vaccination that's the problem. They think the vaccination is the cause of children developing autism. And so in the balancing of two evils, 
they believe they'd rather subject their children to getting measles, which they think is temporary, than their children being autistic, which seems to impact them all their lives. But in making this decision, and there's a primary group of them in New York, in the Jewish community, where a lot of this has started and originated and spawned throughout the rest of the country. Sends people into panic mode, particularly those who have children in the age group that makes them susceptible to c catching these diseases. But we've forgotten how bad measles can be. And there are probably some grown folk who never had the measles which means that you too are subject to having the same problems that come from the measles in the young folk. In fact, it'll be worse. Measles are the underlying problem to one of the worst adult problems you can have, shingles. So it's a problem. When you have a virus that is unchecked, that's a problem. <laughs> We've heard it in so many different refrains from other countries. The Ebola crisis has started up again, or never went away, really. But it's headline news again in the Af on the African continent. The Zika virus had us worrying about mosquitoes. How can you live in Alabama? Or anywhere in the South, for real and not deal with mosquitoes. You can't hardly walk outside without a mosquito singing your song. Viruses can rip our communities apart. But there is one that can grip you that doesn't matter where you live, what your socioeconomic status is, what kind of educational background you have. It can ruin your life. It affects young and old alike. We pretty it up. And like some of the viruses of yesteryear, we won't self-report it. That was one of the problems with the AIDS virus. People would not self-report it. And so they continued to pass it on to people until they passed a law, Deacon Barrett, where they made it a crime to knowingly pass on a virus of that type without informing people that you were going to be intimate with. I don't know how much it helped since those folks thought they had a death sentence anyway. Anyone who would do that didn't care in the first place. So I can't tell you what the prosecution rate was. All I know is they refused to self-report it. The virus I'm talking about, as I mentioned a moment ago, is called jealousy. Now, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. Because like I just said, people don't self-report jealousy. Sometimes I don't even think people realize that they're suffering from side-eye disease. I don't think they recognize that. They think they're too sophisticated. In fact, sometimes the very response people have tells you that they got a deep strain. And sometimes folk, folks say, what you got I want. You ain't got nothing that I want. They're either struggling with the disease or extremely arrogant and sickly to even say something like that. Because can I tell you something? Everybody's got something that other people could benefit from. And the fact that you're arrogant enough to think that you can't benefit from somebody else 
is a problem in and of itself. So let me walk through this, and, and we can look, use Saul, who I will say at the outset of this sermon was a fool. All right? And the reason why I say that, and it's a hard thing to say, is because he had the favor of God on him. He was selected by God. He was protected by God. He was guided by God. But he couldn't appreciate what God had done for him. And so he stopped listening to God. And anybody that knows God, anybody that's been kept by the Lord, blessed by the Lord, and then turns their back on the Lord, in my opinion, meets the definition of a fool. What happens when one is jealous? What is jealousy? Jealousy is, in fact, two things. If I give you a definition of it, I think you'll understand it. The first part of jealousy is resentfulness. You're resentful. Jealousy says, I'm resentful, whether I admit it or not, of what God has done in somebody else's life. That's the first part of it. Resentful. And as if that wasn't bad enough, the second part of jealousy is ungratefulness. So it's resentfulness, and then it's ungratefulness, ingratitude. Why is it un ingratitude, Andre? Because I'm saying I'm resentful of what God has done in other folks' lives, and I'm ungrateful of what God has done in my life. And that puts me in a state of jealousy. We already know from reading the Bible that Saul was flawed. He was living on borrowed time. 1 Samuel chapter 13, Saul thought himself above the directive of the Lord. The Lord told him to wait for the priest to show up and offer a blessing. Saul got impatient. And he went in and offered an unauthorized blessing and sacrifice to the Lord. And because of his impertinence and his impatience, in verse 14 of chapter 13, the prophet Samuel said to him, your kingdom will not endure. Your days are numbered. The Lord has taken his favor from you. Then we move from chapter 13, came to chapter 15. The Lord wanted Saul to completely wipe out the Amalekites when he let them win the victory. I'm going to give you the victory, he said to them. The battle will be yours to win. And he said, when, when, you, when, you, when you take them, I want you to get rid of everything they got. Not just plunder the, the gold and the silver. He said, every dog, cat, sheep, bull, I want you to destroy everything. But Saul only listened to the first part. And he wiped out the Amalekites, just as the Lord said he would. And in disobedience, Saul kept all the cattle and the sheep. And the Lord said to him, verse 11, I am grieved that I have made Saul king over Israel because the man does not listen. He has turned completely away from me. I told you he was a fool. But look at this. Hear me now, because I'm going somewhere with this. But after the Lord said that in chapter 15, after he made this pronouncement, by the grace of God, Saul would go on to be king for another 25 years. This is after the Lord said to him, he doesn't listen, he's turned away from me, God still allowed his grace to flow. 
all over him for another 25 years. So by the time, church, we get to chapter 18, Saul, if you will, has many reasons to be happy and thankful to the Lord. He's had at least 25 years of solid victory as the king. The kingdom has been kept by the king, I mean by the Lord, for at least 25 years. He has been the ruler for 25 years. A promising young warrior under his command has just killed their biggest enemy. He has every reason to be happy, to be ecstatic. Not only that, his family seems to be in good stead. His son has struck up a great friendship with this young warrior who just killed the greatest enemy the country had at that time. The nation was celebrating the goodness of God. Saul should have been able to bask in the moment. Walk with me on this now. How many folk do we have in our community that have been living off God's grace and being blessed for decade after decade? God's been blessing them over and over again. And yet they can't figure out how to turn the page or prepare somebody else to take the mantle for tomorrow's leadership. Instead, they sit there and they have the audacity to be, what did I say, resentful and ungrateful for what God has been doing to them. But watch this now in verse 6. That's where we started this message. While Saul should have been dancing on his tippy toes, Instead, all he could hear was one line out of the victory song. Not even the whole song. Not even the whole song. Just one line out of the song. And that is that David has slain his tens of thousands. And after that, everything in Saul's mind went quiet. Because all he could see was green. He was green with envy because someone that wasn't even trying to, that wasn't even orchestrating it, that wasn't even singing, somebody else would dare get the spotlight from him. Now look. This wasn't, the song wasn't even meant to be a negative on Saul. That wasn't even the intent of the ballad they were singing. It was simply an Israelite custom for the women to make spontaneous victory songs after someone had done something glorious in battle. How many times before has Saul been the recipient of these victory songs. How many times had they cheered him and celebrated him? How many times had he been the one basking solely in the spotlight? Nobody else could get any of it but Saul. But one time, one time, they dare put somebody else's name in the spotlight. And he throws everything else that he'd experienced away. You don't have to look at just this example of this being a historical opportunity for them to do this. If you go back, just point of reference, go read Exodus 15, when the Lord brought the Israelites out of Egypt. You'll find a song of victory there. Go read Judges chapter 5. You'll see another song of victory there. David and Saul is what they were saying, not just David. What they're saying is, if you put David and Saul together, we got a killer combination. That's what they're trying to say about him. But in his mind, all he hears is David in capital letters. Look at this. When you got a jealous spirit 
it warps how you view normal situation. And can I, can I, can I say this to you? Because this is going to probably make you uncomfortable. Jealousy doesn't have anything to do with what you have. It doesn't. It doesn't have anything to do with what you have. It has to do with what you want. Or what you think you deserve. Doesn't have anything. You might have the best of everything. But just because you want it all and think you deserve it all, you don't want to hear nobody else's name called under any circumstance. Saul got offended. He's angry. They credited David with tens of thousands. And he says to him, look, this is how warped it is when you're jealous. He's been the king for over 25 years. Maybe he's hearing the clock tick, Anthony. Maybe he knows that the end of his kingdom is at hand. Maybe he's just realizing how silly he's been to turn his back on the Lord. Maybe that's what's happening to him, Cass, because he says to himself, he killed 10,000 and they're celebrating him. All they got to do now is make him the king. That's what he hears because that's jealousy singing in his ear. Look, Write this down. Time when he should have been happy. Time he should have been celebrating. One of the worst things about jealousy is that you're so obsessed with keeping your eye on other people, it keeps you from enjoying your own life. Keeps you from enjoying what God has blessed you with. Not only that, not only that, it is impossible to be happy and jealous at the same time. It's impossible. Cannot be there. Cannot be there. When you're resentful over what God is doing in somebody else's life, it literally steals your joy. The moment is gone. You lose it. You, you don't get that back anymore. Why? Because you've given the moment of joy over to a moment of resentfulness. You don't get that back anymore. You can't capture the magic or the feeling again. Why? Because you gave it over to jealousy. And when you do that, the natural result is it leaves you feeling miserable and empty. Proverbs 14 and 30 says this. 14 and 13, Proverbs says, A heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy, jealousy, rots the bones. <laughs> jealousy, look at this, jealousy will eat you up on the inside. It will mess you up worse than a killer virus. And that's what happened to Saul. He became obsessed with David. From that moment on, the Bible said he was jealous of David, which means there would be nothing David could do right because everything Saul saw him do was green-tinged because he was jealous of him. You can only see some of y'all got some, some nice Ray-Bans, but when you're jealous, they all got a green tint. Because all you do is see somebody else in the reflection of what you want. And it doesn't matter if they ran into a church and saved everybody in there single-handedly from fire when they come out. You'll say, but them some ugly shoes she got on. <laughs> doesn't matter. You can't see the good they do. You're going to find something negative about what they do because that's how you see life. And look at this, because the Bible shows this, cast that from the moment he started being jealous about Saul, he was already messed up with God, but it accelerated his fall from the throne. It sped up his own demise because every decision he made was made with a view toward getting rid of, look at this, help me, because I hope you see what's not said in the scripture. 
Everything he did was trying to get rid of the one God had anointed. Everything he did was trying to get rid of God's chosen one. Be careful who you mess with. Be careful who you vent your frustrations on. You don't know what God has for them. You might not be fighting them. You probably fighting God. And I can tell you right now, you can't ever win when you're fighting God. See, Saul wasn't there when the prophet said, that's the one. He wasn't at Jesse's house when all them boys paraded through there. He wasn't there when they had to sit up and wait to bring him up from the sheepfold. He wasn't there when the oil was falling down David's face. He didn't know that God had already chosen him to be his one. He didn't know that. All he saw was a little boy that slung a rock and hit a Philistine and killed him. And he thought that was the best David had to offer. He didn't know about the rest that God was going to bless him with. He didn't know that. And Paul, I'm sorry, Saul would sit up and think to himself, David trying to steal my throne. Hear me now. Walk with me on this. I got to get out of here. He said, David trying to steal my throne. Everything, he, when I see David, he playing the harp. He just thinking about songs to get rid of me. <laughs> he see him eating. Look at him, getting full. Trying to fill out my arm. <laughs> That's all he could see. Everything he saw had something to do with David. He said, I ought to change my name to Saul David so I can... Everything had David in it. He tried to kill him over and over, throwing the spear at him. David is simply sitting there playing the harp. Look at this. To soothe, I hope you go read this. To soothe the, the evil spirits. That's what the Bible calls them. Saul was plagued by evil spirits. Yeah, old folks used to say Hanks was on him. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to put a Hank on you. What was a Hank riding him? And he sit there and couldn't get no peace. And David would come in there and play, play the harp. And the, the Bible says that as David was ministering to him, the spirits would leave him. So I couldn't see that. Because he was jealous of him. He could never see that David could have been the biggest blessing in his life. Because all he ever saw him as was a threat. He tried to throw a spear at him while he was playing the harp. David ducked. David ends up becoming closer and closer to his son. He didn't realize that his son knew he was a fool, too. And his son would tell David, Dad is on the warpath. Watch out for him. David's dad is trying to get you this weekend. Don't come over to the house. What did David do to deserve this treatment? Everybody say nothing. Say nothing again. Double nothing. He didn't do anything. It does not equal, the fact that you're jealous of somebody doesn't mean they did something to you. It doesn't mean they've done anything to you. I know people who stay mad at folk because they got a job they wanted. They hate them. All the person did was show up for the interview. They interviewed all of them and they said, you, not the other person. And the person hates them because they didn't get the job. Saul doesn't see that God is blessing everything David does. Why? Because he is not in touch with the Spirit of God. And when you're not in touch with the Spirit of God, you can't know what's happening in the kingdom. I hope you hear me now. If you are jealous, you're controlled by the other spirit not the Spirit of God, and the other Spirit is going to show you what you want to see, 
not what reality is. The other spirit is going to design a situation for you that fits the narrative that makes you feel like you're a victim. They'll pick out something. Hear me now. Hear me. The devil is not omniscient. He's not omnipowerful. He doesn't know all things. He doesn't. He gets his clues from you. And so you're forecasting to him what it is you want to see. And guess what he does? He shows you what you want to see. If you think that person is, is against you, they're going to show you just a little bit. Yeah, they ain't even thinking about you. You don't know they're so tired of you, they shut their whole Facebook page down. But what you're going to say is, they unfriended me. <laughs> no, they unfriended the world because of you. But you're just going to see what you want to see. She stopped following me on Snapchat. No. She shut Snapchat down. You see what you, what you want to see. So look at this. Saul tries to bribe David. After they come back, he says, I'll let you marry my oldest daughter. I'll let you marry my oldest daughter. He does. He blesses him by allowing him, blesses, blesses, air quotes, blesses him by allowing him to marry his oldest, oldest daughter. That's supposed to be the prize for him killing Goliath. David, of course, a little shepherd boy, who wouldn't be thrilled? The king's going to let me marry his daughter. I'm going to be in the royal family. What he didn't realize that he had planted his daughter in David's house so she could keep an eye on him and know what's going on. There was no victory by doing this. He didn't even ask for a dowry from him. He said, the only thing I want you to do is go out and kill a hundred soldiers, a hundred enemies in my name. And David being who David is, Reg, guess what he did? He went out and killed 200. But instead of that being a great victory, Saul said, he just trying to show me up again. Because you see what you want to see. So look at this. The Bible is full of these examples. David didn't do anything. He seemed to be being blessed. No, he was being blessed by the Lord at every turn. And so one of the things that you learn from Saul's life, life is that if you don't get rid of jealousy, jealousy will get rid of you. All right? Jealousy will tear you down. Learn this young. Don't teach your children to be resentful of what other people have. Don't teach your children that because they wanted to make 100 in class, and did not make it, and somebody else did, that that person must have done something wrong. That, because you're smarter than that other person. You're supposed to do better than that other person. There are parents who teach foolishness to their children, that the teacher must be crazy. If the teacher did not give you a hundred, too. Don't teach them these kinds of things, because it's going to change from class to a job, to a husband, to the church, to everything is going to flow. You cannot, you cannot succeed being jealous. It will lead to other sins. All right? J James 3 and 16 says, where jealousy and selfishness are, there will be confusion and every kind of evil. Every kind of evil. Jealousy, without folks saying it, is the root of so many other problems in life. Check this and see if I'm wrong. Has there been a day of his president, presidency that Trump has not said something negative about Barack Obama? Now he can say what he want to say, but if I go back over two years and you say my name every day and I ain't never saying your name, The Bible is full of examples of the damaging effect of jealousy. Look, Genesis chapter 4, we just got into this thing, and jealousy was the root of the, of the first family. The first murder in the Bible took place. Why? Because of jealousy. Crucifixion of Jesus Christ was caused by 
jealousy. Mark 15 and 10 says, it was out of, look, read it now, go back for yourself. It was out of envy that the chief priest had Jesus handed over to him. Jealousy was at the root of all of it. Jealousy. So what we're talking about today is not some little petty some. It's, this is not a summer cold. All right. No, this is no taking aspirin. Go lay down. You'll feel better tomorrow. This is something that will wreck you and your family because they start squaring up. They are families who've been raised in the green eye tent. Folk have created Hatfields and McCoy situations. Why? Because when they cut it down to the root of it, there's jealousy involved in it. So how you get out of this? First thing you need to do is admit you struggle with it. Admission is cleansing. Confess it. Confess, this is a problem that I have. James 3 and 14 says this. Uh, if you harbor, harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Tell the truth. Just, just tell the truth. The truth will literally set you free in this situation. All right? Now, it's hard. It's hard to do this because in order to really deal with it, you got to do the second thing. After you admit it, you've got to deal with your own insecurities. You got to deal with it. Deal with your own insecurities. All right? Because when I finally confess, Yes, I'm dealing with jealousy. I'm dealing with this. Then you got to ask yourself, peel the onion layer back and say, why? Why? Why am I so jealous in this situation? When I admit it, then it either reveals that I am just petty or I am punctured and wounded in some way. And I've got to deal with that. It's got to heal in order for me to get better. But I've got to come clean before God. I've even got to come clean in some instances before my family and let them know that I, I got to deal with this situation and deal with your own securities. A lot of time when people express jealousy, they're expressing their own shortcomings. Every time I'm jealous of somebody, I'm revealing something about myself. Every single time. I don't like myself. I could have done better, but I didn't, so I'm struggling with that. Every single time, I think I need to be somebody else. At, at its base, every insecurity says something about me being insecure. But God tells you this, and let me tell you this, you don't have any reason to be insecure because God made each one of us. He gave us what he thought we needed and what he wanted us to have. Psalms 139 says this, for you were created, you created my innermost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and I know that full well. You've got to examine your own insecurities. And can I tell you this? That may not come from preaching. That may not come from Bible study and teaching. You may have to go get some professional help in order to deal with your own insecurities. You may have to go through some therapy in order to get that together. And there's nothing wrong with you doing that if that's what you need to do. Because every preacher, pastor ain't qualified to deal with some of these issues. And the reason is, some of us dealing with our own issues. Don't recognize it when it is something. You need to go see somebody. And the last third thing you need to do is be more grateful. Look at what you do have. Sometimes we get jealous because we can't control what's going on around us, but God is always in control. He calls all the shots. So put your trust in him. Jealousy at its root is a lack of trust in God. At its root, that's what jealousy is. In other words, God, I don't trust that you know what you're doing because you haven't given me what I think I deserve. And you need to do it over. You need to do it better. And you need to put me out there and make me in charge and put me where I think I need to be. We're questioning God's authority to make the decision. And that's why this is such a serious sin. Put that name on it now. Put that name on it. 
and be grateful for who you are and what you have, what God has blessed you with. Enjoy his blessings in all circumstances according to 1 Thessalonians. And then the last thing is this. You need to refocus on what God wants you to do. Stop looking at what he's got everybody else doing. What is it uniquely that he wants you to do? What is it that's for you and you alone? We talk about it a lot. Just, just, just quickly, how many hours in your life do you think you played the piano? In your life. In your life. How many? Two million hours. Two million hours. And that's probably cutting it short. Yeah, that's what he's just done with his fingers, not in his mind. Uh, you start adding the music he's made in his mind, you put all that together all his life. Yeah, all his life. Why would I get jealous about his ability to play this when he's devoted two million hours to playing and knowing the instrument? If you think logically about it, just because I took four hours of piano lessons, I'm now ready to be the minister of music? <laughs> Only at my daughter's tea party in the bedroom. Think about it. Think about what the Lord has for you. There's no doubt in my mind that music is a part of his life. Music is who he is. I know that, but the question is, what is for you? What is uniquely for you? What has God blessed you to do? What is, and look, you may not do anything that's out front. That doesn't mean it's not important. That doesn't mean it's not important. You just got to do what you do. And guess what? You may not start out doing ultimately what God wants you to do to bless everybody because you may spend 20 or 30 years in training. But ultimately, how long was David in training before he finally became the king? At least 30 years before he ultimately became the king. That's a long time from the time that that prophet came and that priest came and poured that all on his head. But see, you need to know this. David never wanted to be king. God wanted him to be king. There's a difference. There's a difference. David didn't fill out a monster.com application to be king of Israel. He didn't do that. God said, you will be king. And God's saying that to you too. You will be. You will be a blessing to my kingdom. You will be a blessing to someone's life. You will be a blessing to a husband. You will be a blessing to a child. You will be a blessing to a church. You will be a blessing to someone. The question is, is that enough for you? Yeah. You want to be a blessing and a bright light. God might not want you to be a bright light. No, he might want you to be a night light. He might want you to be a closet light. He might want you to be an uh, oven light. All I want to tell you is that when it's your time to shine, let your little light shine. Lord, I'm not. This little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. I'm going to let it shine. Maybe today is the day you want to give your life to the Lord. Maybe today is the day that the Lord has touched you in such a way that you realize that he sent his only begotten son for you. That's how much he loved you. That's how important you are to him. That he sent Jesus Christ to die for you. If you never, ever made him the savior of your life, and then I suggest that you accept the invitation to make him your personal savior. Maybe you've accepted him before and have been looking for a family, a place to call your own church family. I suggest you give us a try. Doors of our church are wide open.
Yeah, and we. 